Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage here in Barcelona, in our studio here in Barcelona. This is theCUBE's coverage. I'm John Furrier, your host with Dave Vellante, extracting the signal from the noise, Mobile World Congress Barcelona, Spain. Exciting to break down day three. We've got four days of live coverage. Shahed Ahmed is in the, in the house here in theCUBE. Group, group EVP, new ventures and innovation at NTT Data. Shahed, thanks for coming on theCUBE. We really enjoyed your kickoff event you had day zero of the event, which is pre-event. Um, thanks for coming on. Feels like a week, uh, a week ago we <laughs> had that. <laughs> How are you holding up? I'm, I'm good, you know, so much excitement at Mobile Congress. It's, I think, day two, and we feels like, um, you know, things are moving so fast, much like AI has taken <laughs> us last uh, six, eight months. So yeah, very excited about all the developments. Yeah. My uh, Instagram and my Facebook and Twitter video from the rooftop party got a lot of views. So everyone's like, oh, rooftop parties are great in Barcelona, a great, good event you put on with your partners. Schneider Electric, one of them, we'll talk about that news. But the, the topic of 5G is on everyone's mind. In the enterprise, which is a really focus area for telcos, they can monetize this opportunity. So there's a lot of telcos here saying, hey, we can hit the enterprise, we can monetize with, with the enterprise market. So the state of 5G is on everyone's mind. Where are we with 5G? What is the state of 5G? Yeah, no, great question. You look, the carriers struggled with monetizing 5G and they, for many, many, many years, they tried to get consumers to pay for it. Are you paying for 5G today no. in the US? No. Probably not, I'm not either. Um, so much like all of us, um, many of the consumer very quickly rejected the idea of paying extra from 4G to 5G. So the carriers are a little bit of a conundrum and now they have to figure out, well, we paid for spectrum, we paid for infrastructure, how do we make money? How do we get the ROI? B2B is the only avenue for them to monetize 5G. And um, so this whole idea of private 5G is something we're pushing very aggressively. Mm -hmm. We believe a private 5G network should be a very CIO-centric, build-yourself network, um, as opposed to a public network being used yeah. in the enterprise. So that's, that's something the carriers still need to figure out. Yeah. They're not quite there yet. You know, one of the things that Dave and I have been hearing here in theCUBE and, and observing in the industry through the CUBE research is that fixed wireless is great. It gets, all the places, 5G is good, but that's a telco view. The IT world inside the enterprise, completely different animal from a mindset standpoint, cultural expectations, uh, technology in some cases, and then you put the cloud into the mix. It's a kind of, it, it's kind of complicated. It's a different ball game. What does that mean? Because that's slowing things down, or is that just the way we are, is that where we're at right now? Well, let's look at who are the customers who are building their own 5G networks. These are industrial companies, automotive companies, manufacturing companies, airports, ports, oil rigs. And one of the key requirements for them is security. And that's something, it's, we all see that in our daily lives, whether, um, whether it's uh, securing your phone or your computer, these enterprise networks have some very critical infrastructure yeah. that have to be absolutely bulletproof. And so that's, how, that's one of the big reasons why private networks is a key uh, capability they're looking to build. Um, and it has to be CIO centric. It cannot be anything other than uh, a CIO agenda or else it's just going to fall flat on its face. Jahid, so often consumer markets lead and then the enterprise picks up on it. We certainly saw that, we've seen that many, many examples, the PC, the iPhone, et cetera. Are you worried that the consumers aren't picking it up or is it going to be the case you think where the enterprises, the B2B, actually seeps into the consumer? Eventually, is there going to be a consumer market, I guess? Yeah, no, I, you know, generally speaking, you're right. Consumer first, and then you right. get the businesses to follow very quickly. And by and large, I mean, this is kind of what happened also in 5G, but, but just no one wants to pay for it. They all want it. We do want it. We just don't want to pay it. We're just waiting. We know yeah. it's coming, right? And so. I think one of the big <laughs> reasons is, you know, there weren't any compelling applications that drove the need for 5G in the consumer space. Whereas in the B2B side, you know, uh, 5G is absolutely needed in the factory floor, 
in the warehouses where you have one square, one million square feet of footage and, and you need coverage. Connectivity yeah. for the AGVs, for the cameras, and Wi-Fi just simply cannot scale. You'll have to have thousands of Wi-Fi access points. Right. And you could do that with six or seven 5G access points. So it's not a density issue or a power issue, it's coverage and ba bandwidth, latency, some of those features. And that, cabling and wiring. To be frank with you, yeah, in, yeah. in factories, these, yeah, yeah. the real estate is, is, is very critical. You can't <laughs> even put a piece of yeah. ethernet cable in there without getting approvals from everybody else. And so, if you think about putting cabling and wiring yeah. for 4,000 Wi-Fi access points versus five 5G access points, it's a pretty easy business yeah. case. A blanket coverage with the 5G 10 times better and you get the benefits that you need. So the question I have for you, what are you guys doing with customers? What is, what is NTT Data doing? Can you take us through what your offerings are? Yeah, so you know, we're a full service uh, global systems integrator. We're also known as a telco in Japan, as, as yep. many of you know, Docomo yep. is the largest uh, wireless carrier there. But outside of Japan, we are a full service systems integrator, much like an Accenture or IBM or um, one of the Indian pure plays. So we offer everything from application services all the way down to network capabilities, which includes data center. We are the third largest data center provider yeah. in the world. <laughs> we have under <laughs> undersea cable yeah. uh, and submarine cables that connects continents. So you can bring the telco understanding to the delivery and formulation of what the enterprises need. So factories would hire you guys to come in. Okay, look, I, got, I need blanket coverage. I don't want to lay cable. I got to integrate it to my back end. I got to put it in the cloud for my whatever mobile app that's over there. This one over here. Is that kind of the, the similar yeah, engagement? Yeah, absolutely. But we bring infrastructure to the table as opposed to some of the other consultants and integrators. That's a big differentiator. So radios? We have radios. We, we work with our um, uh, venture arm called NTT VC. They have a, a relationship with a lot of startup companies, including yeah. Solona, um, a private 5G leader in our opinion. Uh, we might be a little biased, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, we bring infrastructure, we bring networks, and that's our big differentiator. So you guys had news with Snyder Electric on Monday. What was that about? Can you just take a minute to explain the news there? Yeah, as I mentioned before, industrial manufacturing companies are target market for private networks. Um, and for that reason, we established a relationship, an agreement with Schneider Electric, one of the largest industrial companies in the world. And so we would be inserting our private 5G capabilities inside their equipment and their products. When they sell to another manufacturer, private 5G would come right out of the box. Um, and so it's a bilateral relationship. Um, we, would, um, we would be working with also their edge solutions that they have in place, and they would be working with our network solutions. Let me ask you, go ahead. I said one of the policymakers came out this week and was proposing a different way of adjudicating spectrum allocation. Rather than giving it to the highest bidder, they wanted to say, give it to the highest committer, if you will. What's your take on that? Maybe give us your perspective on the whole tech policy, spectrum policy. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think we need a refresh within um, how we allocate spectrum, um, not only in the US, but the rest of the world. Auction is one of the, one of the key tools to get that done. There's very, there are all kinds of different auctioning methodologies. And I think, in the end, we've learned a lot from all the auctions that have happened all around the world. I think it's time for a refresh. Um, and frankly, I think regulators need to think about spectrum very differently. Technology has moved on. The pro uh, processing speed has gone up. Costs per units have gone down. All kinds of tech available today. We don't even need to, in my opinion, regulate spectrum. It could be all mandata mandated by tech. Um, in US, we have um, CBRS, which is a shared spectrum. I think those kinds of uh, policies will suit other countries really well where spectrum is shared through a database that's managed automatically, autonomously. 
Um, and I think that's, that's the future. What's the counter case to that? Is there, there's got to be some political motivation for the other side, and is it, is it, is it revenue, is it, is, is that, is that what As it is? with everything yeah. uh, in politics, revenue and, yeah. and money uh, plays a big part. Yeah. And, and so yes, it absolutely uh, um, is, is a factor. However, if you do open up spectrum, much like CBRS in the US, Wi-Fi if you look 20 years ago, unlicensed spectrum, it opened up all kinds of jobs all kinds of new companies, ecosystems that we've never expected. And I think that's, that's the opportunity. Yeah, but that budget gets diffused and there's a power struggle and F. Okay, I sure. get it. Thank Shahed, you. I got to yeah. ask you about the, on the policy side, connecting over to tech. Uh, we've been hearing a lot of advances about silicon advancements, you know, three nan nanometers is around the corner, stacking wafers, all this density and monolithic versus chiplets, all this stuff's going on. I'm you know, oversimplifying it, but you get the idea. Is there any innovation on the silicon side that's going to maybe help with spectrum issues, um, 5G slicing, some of the areas that might need a little bit of extra horsepower or performance or new ways to architect the systems? Yeah, you know, great question. As you know, the silicon has pretty much reached its physical constraint. Um, I might eat my words next year, but it, <laughs> now they're going into uh, 3D silicon, right? <laughs> you had X and Y, now they're going to the Z axis. Yep. So at some point, you will read some physical constraints and limitation, who knows? Yep. Um, but, uh, you know, look, at the end, uh, the technology is improving and, and the regula regulators, regulators need to also keep up. Mm -hmm. And um, Spectrum is always going to be there as a, yeah. as a, a natural resource. Mm -hmm. um, we just need to effectively and efficiently manage it yeah. um, for, the, yeah. for the rest of the other ecosystems. Let me ask you about topology, not topology, but architecture around cloud, because cloud's been a big part of, in this show this year about telcos and cloud native microservices, some say it's going to create kind of a blind spot around 5G, you got encryption, observability is needed in some of these apps. That's, a, that's one conversation. Then the other conversation is around data sovereignty, global deployments. What's your view on NTT Data's experience with customers around global deployments? Because you got sovereignty issues, sovereign clouds going around the corner, so cloud's coming. Now telcos are, they do have physical Infrastructure, yeah. so yep. they're kind of set up for geography. Opportunity, tailwind, what's your view on the, the global aspect of uh, things like that? And of course you got open, open environments where they want to get more APIs, but what's your take on global? Well, I think you know. a, lot of, a lot of this is now being driven by AI, frankly. That's, that's going to drive how clouds are going to be architected in the future. Um, and you know, with the EU AI Act that just got enacted only a few months ago, um, that's that everybody's watching that because it has a lot of sovereignty, privacy aspects to it. Um, I think, to me, cloud architectures of the future are going to be driven mainly by the AI constructs yeah. that enterprises are going to be building <laughs> for themselves, for their stakeholders. Um, and mainly, you know, everyone's kind of watching how this yeah. regulations around AI unfold. Yeah. I mean, I think the telecom estates that have that regional or local infrastructure will win. Fixed wireless is a good thing. Oh, absolutely, and, yeah. and I think, um, look, there's, there's, some of the enterprises have been frustrated with even their current cloud um, infrastructure and you know, their economics are now, they're wondering if these economics <laughs> even make sense, <laughs> and should they build in-house? Yeah. And so now we're seeing a shift, and AI is now kind of driving some of that also approaches, so. I got to say, the AI edge conversation really has elevated the game on what's going on at the edge, how do we think about the data, and, and, and whatnot. Maybe that's a killer 5G app, AI will spawn it. Right? I mean, yes. we believe so. I mean, I think, you, I think well, you're also, right. I think you think, you think, you think the killer, what do you think the killer app is for, for 5G? Is it Edge? To me, it, it is Edge AI, and you know, frankly, factories, even before Chad GPT showed up in September of 23, yeah. um, H100s were all over the factory floor, doing things like digital twin, uh, virtualizing the PLCs, and yeah. so on, and, 
and you know, those are all edge AI apps. Yeah. And by the way, all of those PLCs have to be connected. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. they all require massive bandwidth and low latency. That's a great network. point. That's a great point. And at the top of the interview, you actually pointed this out that the state of 5G is about monetizing for the telcos. So this is a great win-win. Telcos can take it right to the market with B2B enterprise and or enterprise or intelligent edge, industrial edge is the low-hanging fruit. I mean, factories are low-hanging fruit. Okay, so yeah, they are and they're not because they are very um, you know, rigid structural um, enterprises that have some very tough requirements. Yeah. And so, you know, yeah. telcos can't just show up with a public network. Yeah, yeah. They have to come in with a full suite of integration services. So there's what, 5.6 5 billion connected users? Is that right? Is that something like that? Yeah. How many PLCs are there? <laughs> uh, there there's, there's even trillions maybe. So, so, <laughs> my point. So, Again, my, my earlier question about consumer, it's always consumers the lead. Why is it that consumer markets lead? It's because of the volume. If in fact the machine to machine volume is that large, and even larger potentially to consumers, that could trickle, the mainspring could be yeah. enterprise Absolutely. and edge into consumer markets, because it's all about the volume and the cost. Yeah, and, and you know, price per bit is also high because yep. You know, assuming you'll add some more services on top of just that one little bit, um, including security services, yeah. provisioning, activation services, things that you already do, but now for an enterprise. Yeah. Yeah, speaking of consumers, I heard you guys got some news today with BMW. What was that about? Yeah, we're very excited. Going back to the PLC's metaphor, um, there are more cars than potentially humans, <laughs> right? And so every car yeah. in the future will be a connected car. Um, you know, we, I'm sure you have cars at home and you do log in or check the status of yeah. your fuel or your oil or start your- Start my car right now. Yeah, you can start. <laughs> but you need to have a eSIM inside the car. Yes. Some sort of cellular connectivity right. so you can actually see uh, what your car's doing or where it's at at yeah. the moment. And so, we're working um, with uh, BMW to put um, a eSIM, um, I'll give you one of these, yeah. um, uh, from our, one of our MVNOs called Transitel, and we're, we have contracts with over 200 uh, countries all around the world. Very cool. And so for an automotive company, do they, they go to one carrier and try to strike agreements with uh, you know, two, 200, uh, countries, or should they go to one uh, MVNO and be able to do that? And so yeah. we provide that value proposition. Ubigi? For these is, it, is it Ubigi? Ubigi. Ubigi? Ubigi? Yeah. And you can Ubigi. go get it in Amazon Ubigi. too. Try it now, one gigabyte. I don't know if you can get it here. So, one there gig, you. here we go. Yeah. Ubigi. And a gig, try it for free. And then on the back side, so there's a QR code on the back yep. side, it says, Need more data? <laughs> yes. Uh, you're going to need more data. And oh, you can beautiful. get it from Amazon store directly. Brilliant. Yep. Download it to your your <laughs> iPhone or Thank you for the plug. Android. Yeah. <laughs> We're here to please. <laughs> Jed, thanks for sharing your yeah. insights on 5G. Really appreciate you. And thanks for uh, having us over to your event. Really appreciate you coming on theCUBE, getting that perspective. It was my pleasure. Good Thanks for a great interview. All right, we love, we love getting the data. We're going to bring you know, all the action, extracting the signal from the noise here in theCUBE. This is our Barcelona CUBE studios here in Spain. I'm John Furrier, your host with Dave Vellante. We'll be right back with more after this short break. Mm -hmm.